intuition is defined as mostly as knowing without knowing how you know it or the knowledge that doesn't know itself. But I actually think there's a better definition. I think it's by Daniel Kahneman who once said, intuition is thinking that you know something without knowing why you do. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. I will live every day as if there were a microphone tucked under my tongue. It's great to get in the game, but don't get in the game until you understand the rules till you're an insider. Your life changes when you begin having a different conversation in your head. What we need to do in radically deep problems is propose radically visionary solutions. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Greetings, everyone. My name is Julie Masters, and you're listening to another episode of Inside Influence, in which I delve into the minds of some of the world's most fascinating influencers or experts in influence to get to the bottom of what it really takes to own your voice and then amplify it to drive an industry, a conversation, a movement, or a nation. Now, here's today's question. How do you approach the big decisions in your life? That's probably too big of a question. So let's make it smaller. How do you approach the small decisions in your life? I want you to imagine you're sat down on a Friday evening, you've got a glass of wine in one hand, potentially some chocolate in another, and you're trying to decide what to watch on Netflix. Are you still there an hour later arguing with your partner, flicking through options, Googling reviews, and drowning in a sea of trailers? Or do you make a fast and furious call, knowing that you can always pull the plug after five minutes if it doesn't work out? How we do one thing, like the seemingly unimportant task of choosing what to watch on Netflix, can often be a good indicator of how we do all things. How we make decisions, and here's the kicker, because whether we make decisions or not, not making a decision is still a decision, can be one of the biggest determiners of our success. Now that includes how quickly we're able to make a call and keep moving, how willing we are to stop what's not working and change direction where we decide to place our time and attention and how much we let indecision drain both our energy and the energy of our teams. Not to mention that the influence we're able to have over other people, our leadership, is often based on the perceived speed, conviction and wisdom of our decision making by those around us. So it's strange, or at least it's kind of strange to me, that we pay so little attention to having a strategy in this area of our lives a clear blueprint around how we make decisions, one that we can use and also one, importantly, that we can communicate to other people when it comes to explaining the types of decisions that we have made. Now, that's where my guest comes in today. Mikael Krogus is an editor with Switzerland's biggest weekly magazine, Das Magazin. Alongside his colleague, Roman Tschäppler, he became so fascinated with why human beings find making decisions so hard. They then went on a fact-finding mission and they ended up writing the decision book. They thought it would sell probably about 100 copies. Instead, it ended up on bestseller lists around the world and went on to sell over 1 million copies in over 20 languages. In today's conversation, we dive into why he originally became so fascinated with decision making and what makes it so hard for human beings to make decisions at all. The TMI paradox. Here's a hint on this one. Brain scans of those who have too little information look exactly the same as those who have too much information. So how can you know when you have too little or too much to make the best possible call? The role of gut feel or instinct, this was one I was super fascinated in, or as Mikhail calls it, the unknown knowns. Often we don't know how much we really know about a topic or we don't, we don't acknowledge how much we know about something. And that includes the difference between intuitive and, in- and intelligent decision making and how much priority we should really be placing on that inner guidance, that inner gut feel. How to make good decisions when there is no time, including why no decision is a decision in itself and sometimes a wise one. And finally, why Nessie doesn't exist. Yes, this is actually me talking to an accomplished Finnish journalist about a mythical Scottish sea monster and how our obsession with making a perfect choice is often one of the most paralyzing decisions of all. What I would love you to reflect on while you're listening to this episode is probably obviously where you currently sit in the realm of decision making. 
Is there one decision right now that you're struggling with, present or future, that potentially needs a different approach, a more considered approach? And another thing to consider, which we do touch on, is the the state of decision fatigue. This one caught my attention. This is where we're so good at making decisions that every single decision seems to end up in our lap. So in order to increase our own influence in those moments, we need to create a framework for decision making that we can communicate to other people and then pass on some of those lower rung choices. Or finally, like me, do you just need to get faster at making a call? Because movement often begets movement and an imperfect choice made, this is me talking to myself, usually beats a perfect choice never made. If you are looking to take your journey in influence to the next level, don't forget to hop onto my website or visit the show notes and download the latest version of my ebook, The Influencer Code. It covers the seven areas and seven core questions that I have found after 20 years of doing this work, hands down, will accelerate your influence journey. There's no need to spend two decades of your life doing this the hard way. I've got your back. Just pop in your email address. It will be in your inbox and the time it takes to make a cup of tea. No spam, just valuable information. On that note, sit back, cycle straight and prepare to become a decision-making master with the incredible Mikhail Krogos. Welcome to the podcast, Mikhail Krogeras. Hi, thank you for having me. Oh, it's so good to so good to have you here. Um, I'm going to kick off the podcast in a way that I'm kicking off a lot at the moment, and that is to ask you about an idea or a concept that's having a lot of influence on you right now. And the theory being, and I'm testing it, the theory being that people who have interesting or fascinating ideas tend to come across interesting or fascinating ideas before anybody else. They just have a wider radar. So over to you, what's one idea that's really stuck with you recently? Oh, I love that question. Um, I think one concept I've been pondering a lot lately is actually just a notion or, or a sentence uh, by the Icelandic artist Olafur Eliasson. And he mentioned recently in an offhand remark, sometimes the river is the bridge. Now, I'm not entirely sure what he meant by this, but as I understand it, um, Sometimes uh, you will find the answer in a place you weren't looking for. Sometimes the force you're struggling with might turn out to be the one helping you. Or sometimes we'll find an inner energy that helps us carry on in a way we had never thought it would be possible to do. So basically, sometimes things turn out to be totally different than we had expected. So I always try to remind myself, um, whenever I'm stuck or lost or bored, sometimes the river might be the bridge. I love that. I love that. And it it fits so nicely with something that I've been kind of battling with in my own head recently, which is the, the concept that you you don't arrive at simplicity. No one arrives. You know when you see people and they have a beautifully simple argument or a beautifully simple concept or product or idea, and to remind myself constantly that no one arrives immediately at simplicity. You have to wade through complexity to get to like you earn simplicity, which is similar to that. You have to wade through the river. You know, the river becomes the bridge. The complexity becomes your only way into simplicity. Exactly. And also to accept um, complexity. I sometimes think we just strive for this moment when it's all in flow. But you have to be in there. You have to be in the water in order for it to carry you. And I think sometimes that has to do with, are we brave enough for that? <clears throat> do we really dare to do it? And it feels so good if we get out there and let the water carry us. But we have to take that first step. And that's often not so easy. And we have to surrender. We have to jump and we have to surrender to the, we were just talking before coming on air about parenting and you have to jump in and you have to surrender any control you thought you had. So that, yeah, there's so much in that. Thank you for sharing that. I love that one. Um, I want to talk to you today about decision making and, you know, I've personally really enjoyed your work on this topic. I've watched many videos that you've put together on this topic and I really love the approach that you bring to it. So I'm just going to stop talking and let you jump in. I wanted to kick off with the question about how did you become so fascinated with decision making? Was it something that you personally struggled with or was it just a topic that caught your eye? Uh, well, to be 
totally frank, I must say, um, it all started many years ago when it dawned on me that I'm actually not a really good decision maker. Uh, I realized I tend to make a lot of gut decisions that I regret afterwards or that I second guess. And on the other hand, when I try to really think things through and dis um, and make a thorough and diligent analysis, I often ended up with a decision that turned out to be quite foolish. And then again, I sometimes made lighthearted, quick decisions that turned out to be really wise, actually. So I asked myself, why? And being a reporter, um, I love these why moments because it seemed, it means that you start out really looking for answers. And um, what I did then was that I talked to a good friend, Roman Chapela, who is the co-author of my books. And I realized he's a totally different guy. He's organized and structured and he has a very project management like approach to life, but he's also struggling with decision making. So I, th I thought to myself, I really want to know what does science know about decision making and are there any tools out there that could that could help me and help us? One of the things that struck me when I was looking at your work is why is it so, why is it so hard for human beings to make decisions? I mean, I don't know any other creature on the planet that struggles with decision making the way that we do. And you mentioned it there. You know, you make highly thought out decisions and you struggle with whether it was the right one. You make quick decisions. You struggle if it's the right one. You get lots of information, not enough information. What is it uniquely about human beings that makes us struggle in this area? Well, actually, all animals, humans and non-humans alike do a thorough decision-making analysis. We all weigh the advantages and disadvantages of our choices, and we try to behave accordingly. But I think um, the humans are the only animal that thinks about the long-term future and beats himself up about it. Uh, we are the only animal that worries about making a mistake. And also, we are the only ones that look back at past mistakes and think, oh my God, why did I do that? And there's a beauty in it because um, this ability lets us plan and learn, but it also leads to procrastination and, and this uh, decision fatigue. So I think being a human is a pretty cool thing, but it's also pretty tiring. And I sometimes look at my cat and think, why can't I be like you? Uh, but she never looks at me like she'd be asking herself the same question. Um, so I think it's something very human to being able to worry about the future and reflect on the past. And this is something that is truly human and very important for our life and our way of being. But it's also the source of agony and 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 uh, worry. It's. Uh, I'm thinking as you're talking. It's almost as if human beings are required or need to. And we, you know, we don't know with the animal kingdom half as much as we should know about about what goes on you know, under the surface, but we are required to live in three places. We're required to live in the past. We're required to analyze the decisions of the past and, and learn from them. We're required to project out into the future and figure out you know, what, how might this play out. And we're also required to be in the present and figure out what does everybody need right now? What are the factors that, I'm, you know, that need to bear in mind in this present moment? Is it something to do with that? Is it something to do with having to live across so many different kind of time parameters that makes it different? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, an, an ordinary animal has, it, it's living on its instinct. So we do that too. I mean, if you are hungry, you will get something to eat. If you are tired, we go to sleep. So we do that too. But on top of that, we have a quite complex social life that has to be managed. And that life is getting more and more complicated because we... We do have more options. We have more obligations. We also have more expectations. We want to have a better life and joyful life. And and all of this has to be managed. And management actually is just like a long, long, long set of small, small, small decisions the whole time. And this can be quite tiring, which is called actually decision fatigue. That is a technical term in psychology that describes this ongoing process of constantly weighing your options and this leads us to um, feeling stress. So um, it's, it's a quite human condition to have um, the feeling of being overwhelmed by decisions. You've identified three phases of decision making. And, you know, I'm hoping that this is going <laughs> to help me not feel so overwhelmed by the sheer volume of decisions that need to get made in a day. 
The first phase of that is preparing, is having an information strategy. What what do you mean by an information strategy? Well, I think the problem with decision making is not only the fact that we could make a mistake, but that we spend too much time and energy trying to avoid doing that mistake. So say, um, let's take a fairly simple example. Say we want to buy a car. Now, we could spend the rest of our life researching that very decision. And we will learn more and more and avoid more and more mistakes, but we will also lose a lot of time and energy. So decision-making is always a trade-off. How much time do I want to spend avoiding mistake? And how quick will I make that decision? And you can't have both. You can't have quick decisions and no mistakes. So um, I always suggest to set yourself um, limits. So if we go back to that example of you want to buy a car, we can say, um, let's do a research strategy and say we spent three hours on Google. We we're going to ask two friends who know a thing or two about cars, but who also know our needs and limits. And then we're going to visit two car dealers. And after that, we're going to buy a car. And we will not end up with a perfect car but we will end up with a car that is good enough. And we will have saved a lot of time and energy. So even if it isn't the best choice, it can make us happier than no car at all or endlessly searching for one. So I think the idea of having a research strategy is to try to limit yourself to just spend endless hours on the internet or thinking about that decision. Because in the end, how important is that car? You really have to prioritize. Do, is it important? Uh, how much would a mistake weigh if I buy a car that is not perfect? And do you adjust that information strategy dependent on how important it is? So if it's a hugely important decision that's going to impact your life for years to come, you spend longer on it. If it's a small decision and the impact in you know six months to one year is minimal, then you would spend a shorter amount of time on that decision. Exactly. That's, that's, that's very important to stress. Um, there are certain decisions that need a lot of time and should not be done hastily. I mean, political decisions, but also maybe sometimes health decisions, and uh, we do them too quickly. So it's always good, and we, I think we're going to talk about that later. It's always good to step back and let there be some time between um, the initial action and your reactions or your decision towards it. But if when it comes to these elements of, for example, shopping, or personal decisions, I have the feeling, and this is supported by by data actually, that people agonize too much over things that actually don't play a huge role in our life. I met somebody recently actually that that had a really interesting approach to decision making, and he had the rule of eight. The rule of eight, and <laughs> the rule of eight said that if he he would think about something eight times. So once he had thought about something eight times, he was very strict with himself, and he had to make a decision. And his rationale being that once I have thought about something more than eight times, now I'm just going over and over the same information. My my ability to make a decision isn't getting any better. That's a wonderful strategy. I mean, if he can really do that, that's that's a really (laughs) decision-making hero there. Because I think we all know that that the longer we, we think about things, the more complex they get. And it's really hard to find that sweet spot where we realize now we know enough in order to just make that decision. So that rule of eight, um, I, will try to, <laughs> I will try to apply that in future. <laughs> I, think you, I think you need to have a special kind of brain to keep track of how many times you've thought about something. But I like the idea of having boundaries around your decision making. Talk to, talk to me about the TMI paradox. Yeah, that's related to that. Um, TMI is what we call too much information paradox. And we have to um, look at it like this. If we know very little about any given topic, um, then we feel insecure and we're not in a position in order to make a decision. If we feel insecurity, our brain gives us a very, very clear message. It says, uh, get more information. And the more we know, the better we feel. And today it's very easy to get a lot of information, as we just said about the car. If you thoroughly Google for three hours the topic of what car should I buy, you will end up with quite a big um, chunk of knowledge. And you will be, uh, you will feel good about that. And then you will also feel better about making a decision. But, and here comes the paradox, and there's a tipping point. 
um, you can actually know too much because there's this sweet spot where we start questioning our own knowledge. And we go back and we think, oh, maybe maybe I shouldn't or could I or someone said. And this is maybe this uh, eight, eight times your, your friend is thinking about things because then we start questioning what we know and we're getting more and more confused again. And we end up at a position that is as confusing as the one where you have very little knowledge. Is there a, is there a magic number there? I mean, we're talking about you know the paradox of TMI where we – we don't have enough information and then all of a sudden we find ourselves drowning in information and we're just as clueless as before. And I know I've heard you say in the past that brain scans of those who have too little information actually looks the same, same level of confusion in your brain as people who have too much. What's the, what's the tipping point? What's the magic number? It's really hard. It's really hard to say. Um, it's and also different for, for different people. But intuitively, you might think that the more options you have, um, the better your outcomes will be. But that's not true. Um, sometimes the opposite is true, actually. The greater the choice, the higher our expectations, and the more we worry that we will make the wrong decision. And this is the so-called paradox of choice that the American professor Shina Yenga demonstrated in a legendary experiment. Um, and I think um, in a supermarket, she offered a variety of marmalades or jams uh, for shoppers to try. And she had six different varieties on one day and 24 varieties on another. With the smaller selection, 40% tried the marmalade and 30% bought a jar. The bigger selection attracted 60% of the shoppers, but only 2% bought a, 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 um, a jar of marmalade. So the conclusion here is, apparently choice is alluring, but it is confusing. So um, Shida Yenge makes this uh, bottom line rule. You should try to limit your options if you are confused. So not, do not try to choose between 24 cars. That might be alluring, but it's confusing. Try to narrow it down to, let's say, three to six items. And I think that that plays out in so many different areas. You know, it plays out from a product standpoint. When we're, we, our natural inclination is sometimes to give our customers as many options as possible or our teams as many options as possible, feeling like, you know, the more options we give them, the more likely they are to feel included in the decision, to choose something. And actually that's misguided. The, the fewer the choices you give, you give people, the more likely they are to make a choice. And I also feel, and I'd love you to speak to that. I feel like something else happens where they assume we have certainty when we do that is to work with this amazing salesperson who would go into client meetings and she would say, I, I could give you a hundred options, but I'm going to give you my ace and an alternative. And there was her authority would just shoot through the roof in that moment because they would go, that's what I need. I need someone to bottom line this for me, translate my options. Oh yeah. I mean, this is, <laughs> this is something that we do intuitively wrong. And I think we'll speak about intuition later, but I think intuitively we think I want to have all the options and I want to have the freedom of choice. But actually, there's a, there's a bunch of super interesting research that should suggest that actually we don't need to have our, the own, our own choice. Um, sometimes we're happier if we have someone else who makes the decision for us. And um, if we think about how we can solve this paradox of choice in our day-to-day -day lives, um, there's a simple recommendation. I think this is by the psychology professor Barry Schwartz, if I'm not mistaken. He says, limit your options. So for example, in a restaurant, pick the first dish on the menu that you like, and then immediately close the menu so you don't know what's coming after, <laughs> so you don't have any more options. Or if we take the example of having someone else choose, and I like to do that with friends in a restaurant, have your friend or your spouse choose a dish for you. Um, it's so it's such a nice and refreshing experience to give away that moment of choice, um, and it gives you a surprise. It gives you something to talk about, and also it delivers you. Um, it's, it deliberates you from the moment of having to choose, and even choosing from a menu. This is uh, there's a lot of data on that. Can be super. Uh, exhausting for people who are struggling with uh, decision fatigue. So I think try to give um, other people the chance to choose for you. That's a, that's an interesting interesting experience. When my when my husband and I were first dating, 
one of the one of the moments where I thought, oh, I, you know, I think I could like this guy. We went out to a restaurant and we sat down, and I had a fledgling business at that point. I was making a thousand decisions a day, and he he said, "Would you like me to choose for you?" And honestly, if anyone had asked me if I wanted that before, I would have said, no, I'm perfectly capable of choosing my own food. Thank you very much. But just the moment where I was like, yes, thank you. That would be amazing. The the gift of you picking something that you think that I would love and giving that to me and the, the interest of me finding out what you've picked for me actually just takes all the weight off my shoulders. And this is now not a decision to make, but more just a journey to go on. Such a romantic, such a romantic gesture. I like that story. It could have gone badly wrong for him. Honestly, <laughs> I, would, I would have thought I would have responded very differently. But luckily, luckily for him and I, I didn't. Talk to me about black swans when it comes to decision making. Unknown unknowns. Things we don't know, we don't know. And this is an area where, um, we, I mean, we as humans, we can plan and we can assume and we can imagine and visualize, but we don't know what will happen, right? And the unknown unknowns are the things that we didn't prepare for because we didn't know that we didn't know that this could actually happen. And these things are also called the black swan. For the longest time, we didn't know that black swans existed. We only knew about white swans. Um, but then... Actually, in Australia, I think, a Dutch researcher found a black swan in Western Australia in the 17th century. And he returned to Europe and presented his black swan. And then, of course, all the biologists said, yes, of course, of course, there is a black swan. So with the benefit of hindsight, these unknown, unknown actions all seem very logical and clear and easy to understand. But you can't foresee them. And actually, I think that's life, right? I mean, there's this beautiful notion of uh, life is what's happening to you while you are busy making plans. And this is it. Um, We can make strategies. We can improve our decision making. We can uh, try to stay away from from biases, but we can't really plan out our life. Actually, things turn out often to be different. And I think that's also the beauty of life. You have to accept and embrace that things turn out differently because uh, it can it can of course be tragical but it can also be beautiful and i think we should embrace these unknown unknowns moment so i want to i want to talk about gut feel here or instinct because i don't i don't feel like we can have this discussion about decision making without factoring in our gut it's such an important part of how many of us make decisions or how many of us judge the decisions that we've made how, in all your research, how much of a priority should we place on that elusive gut feel? Oh, that's a great question, and and it's also a difficult one. Um, I would say I think you should prioritize it, but at the same time be very skeptical about it. Um, intuition is defined as mostly as knowing without knowing how you know it, or the knowledge that doesn't know itself. But I actually think there's a better definition. I think it's by Daniel Kahneman who once said, intuition is thinking that you know something without knowing why you do. So we have to be be clear that intuition or gut feeling, that's mostly experience and partly also prejudice. So the simple example is if you see a person of color and you have a weird feeling, that is not good intuition. That is racist prejudice. So intuition can often get in the way of clear or smart thinking. But at the same time, there's also an upside to intuition. So for example, if a decision is complex and there doesn't seem to be an obvious answer and we have gathered a lot of data and we have thought about it a lot, it is worth taking a break from thinking because our subconscious is better at sifting through large amounts of data. And there is this famous uh, simple trick by a Dutch psychologist who said, if you can't decide between two options, toss a coin. And while it is spinning in the air, you will probably sense which side you want to land face up. So you then don't even have to look at the actual result because you then freed yourself from your rational thinking and somehow switched off your subconscious thinking. And that is something I think people should try out because it's really, really powerful. You know, when you were, you were talking then and you were talking about flipping a coin, I could feel my whole body tense up. Don't, don't flip a coin for an important decision. And so I was very glad that that story ended the way that it did. And I think it's, there's always that moment, right, where you have a gut feel 
and then you you collect your data. And I love what you said there around the distinction, the distinction between sometimes our gut feel can be old stories that play out in our subconscious that are no longer helpful. And they can be, they could be potentially racist, they could be potentially sexist. It could just be that somebody reminds you of somebody that you used to know and you didn't like them very much. So there's that moment of acknowledging a gut feel. And then there's the going out and collecting of information, collecting of opinions, collecting of insights. And then once you've digested all of that, then rechecking back in, is my gut feel the same? Has it shifted? And I love that, again, boundaries, because you flip a coin and you need to make a decision before the coin lands. What decision would you make? You had to make a choice right now. What would it be? And you've, you've said before that we always forgive our gut more than our head. And I think that's important because we're at the end of the day, we're usually the, usually unless we're in politics, one of the only judges of our own decision making. We're the ones that will give ourselves the hardest time. Why do we forgive our gut, the decisions we make from our gut better than the ones that come from our own brains? That's a good that that's that's a good question, and I don't think we know the answer. Um, what researchers have found is that faced with a simple choice, we pick better cars. For example, again, if we can think things through, but when confronted with a complex decision, we easily become paralyzed by our by our analysis. I think, and actually, we make the best choices when we did not consciously analyze the options and somehow um, we feel better if we did this gut feeling thing because then it seems like this is a choice that came out of ourself whereas if we do analysis we use data from outside and then we of course think oh i thought so much about this and then i did the mistake whereas if i go with my gut feeling it feels more like well i just wanted to do that and that's a very very powerful force and we can we can use that and rely on that and feel good about that and i think that's why i would encourage um gut feeling decisions but at the same time be very skeptical about it because you have to ask yourself who is talking <laughs> when you follow your gut feeling there's, there's been a lot of science recently about about gut and the gut brain and the amount of neurons in your gut versus the amount of neurons in your brain and just the sheer volume of information that your gut can process you know as compared to your own mind do you have you come across that science have you how do you feel about it does it has it impacted how you feel on this topic well i think that that's um if we say gut feeling i don't know if it's i know that some people say the gut is also part of your brain and that's of course true in many examples but if we say gut feeling is just a word for it i think we can also use uh, inner voice or higher sense or whatever you say it's just that feeling that you there is a part of you that knows more than you think you know i wanted to talk about decision making when there's no time there's a lot of what we've talked about so far is decision making when we have the time to analyze we have the time to gather data we have the time to ask other people but often we have to make decisions very quickly is there a, a process that we can run when it comes to a fast decision that will likely lead us to a better outcome well i would always say take a step back and reflect for a few moments so that your emotions aren't driving the decision emotional driven decisions are mostly bad um, and but because when we're stressed we often think there is no time but actually there is and um, i once talked to members of the special forces in finland about this and one soldier told me that There are two things. One is practice, practice, practice. So really try to know the routines for these stressful moments. But secondly, he said, you often have more time than you actually think. And actually, the key issue when things go really wrong isn't that someone made the wrong decision. It's more that no one made a decision. So I think um, if you're under time pressure, take a step back, breathe, Focus on the goal, not the decision. So don't overestimate the moment what you have to decide, but focus on what does this decision lead to? What is the goal of our decision? Now, I think um, if you look at really skillful decision makers, I think they are willing to take what is called uh, the least worst decision. So they are accepting that whatever we are doing is going to be wrong, but we have to do something. And this is this one uh, very famous example of um, the, I think he was American or Canadian, um, the mountaineer Simon Yates. 
and his incredible story was told in the film Touching the Void. And Yates cut the rope on his injured climbing partner, John Simpson, or Joe Simpson. And um, he was aware that Simpson would probably die as a result. But Yates concluded that if he avoided that decision, both men would die. Fortunately, Simpson also survived miraculously. But um, that's an interesting point. You have to make a decision. If you don't make a decision, um, things will turn out even worse. That's an incredible movie for anyone that's listening to to check out. I've, I've watched it. I've watched it a couple of times, actually. Um, that not making a decision, that not making a decision piece and that a decision is better than no decision. I think I was talking to a CEO recently and she was new to the role and a lot of people were looking at her to make new decisions about the company and she had been brought in as new blood. And she said something really wise. She said, I'm going to make no decisions for the first 60 days. And I'm going to let everybody know that I'm making no decisions for the first 60 days because I just want to watch. I want to watch the type of decision-making that happens independently. I want to watch how people respond to uncertainty, those that kind of float off and, and those that can anchor themselves. And I also want to watch what happens when fires come up and who jumps in and how they handle it. And it just it struck me that sometimes making no decision at all can be a decision and can be a very strong decision. Do you have any guidance about knowing when making no decision at all is the right move and when it's a potentially damaging move? I think sometimes the bottom line is here again, whatever you had to do, it relates to what we're just talking about. It's always good to take a step back and breathe. And um, because if you don't do things, you can also just say um, whatever you had to do didn't get done and maybe it didn't really matter. I think we sometimes uh, overestimate the power of our decisions. And if you're not doing a decision, it's good, again, to step back and breathe. And there's this um, beautiful uh, word by the um, Zen philosopher Alan Watts, who once wrote, muddy water is best cleared by leaving it alone. And I think that's true. If we can't see clearly, if we are totally insecure, and if it's just getting all too much, we should step back and let time step in. And things will clear up over time, and then we can see how to decide. However, and that's very important, if we decide to postpone the decision or not decide at all, we have to communicate that. And um, this is something that... um, often is a problem in project management if the leader takes the decision to not take a decision but doesn't communicate it. Then this causes a lot of agony and insecurity in the team. So I think um, it would be good to be honest about your insecurities and just say, I don't know yet, I don't want to make a decision at the moment, or we're going to talk about this next week in order to let time step in, but everyone to know this is postponed. And I think that speaks to what you were saying before, which is we always have more time than we think. We, it's, it can be very easy to get lost in the urgency of everybody else. People are telling you that you're coming into your office and saying the decision is urgent or a salesperson is telling you you need to make a choice now, otherwise this discount will disappear. There's always, there's no shortage ever of other people's urgencies. And just taking a moment and going, actually, no, this is, this is too important for it to be urgent treated with with urgency i'm going to take a minute be it a minute a day 24 hours and think this through and i'll come back and let you know how i feel and backing yourself like that right and also helping your um, employees or your team members to um to be honest about their feelings about decisions i think if we talk too little about it and we think the ceo who makes these very clear cut and quick decisions is the best one I think it's important to stress that we are all emotional people and we all have our insecurities and be open about that because there are no perfect solutions. This is really, really, uh, this is really an illusion. But there are strong and brave decisions that have that upside and the downside. And I think we should be more open about what decisions we take and why we take them and also the insecurities we have around them. And if we don't, one of the things I noticed during COVID was that the leaders that were really standing out weren't necessarily the ones, no one knew what was happening. No one knew what was going to happen. Nobody had this bright, shiny horizon that they were able to offer anybody. 
And those that were standing out were those who would say, okay, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen in order to be able to make the best possible decision. But what I can give you is a framework for my decision making. When this particular situation arises, I will make this decision. When this kicks in, I'm going to make this decision. So this is my framework for decision making. We're all on the same page. And although I can't tell you when any of this is going to happen, this is the blueprint that I'm using. Absolutely. This is it. I think the last year was a was a study in decision making, how you should and what you should and what you shouldn't do. And what is really wrong is to say, I know the answer and just pull it through in order to, to appear strong. What is much more powerful is to say, this much we know, based on this knowledge, I will do A or B, but I am open to question my own decisions. I think this is such a strong notion, and I, I've heard that so little. <laughs> you talked before about black swans, and the black swans being that you know there's always going to be something that you could never have seen coming, i.e. a black swan. <laughs> Do you factor that in? And I often wonder this, you know, when we question our assumptions in decision making, you know, what assumptions have I made to reach this decision? Well, I've assumed that this will be true. I've assumed that this will be true. I've assumed that this doesn't exist. When When is it good to question your assumptions? And when is just the endlessness of how many things you might possibly not be able to anticipate just a waste of time and you need to keep moving? Well, again, it depends on the decision. Um, I always like to go back to the example with buying a car. I think if you agonize over the black swans of buying a car, uh, that's a rabbit hole. <laughs> Don't go down there because you are bound to buy the wrong car. And you just have to factor in that you're going to live with it. However, if we think about strategic decisions, um, really, really long-term decisions, um, I think sometimes we, and also political leaders, make decisions based on too little knowledge. So I think the question with black swans is when do we take the time to think about the things we don't know about? And that's a question that, um, for example, CEOs sometimes should do. <clears throat> we are very focused on uh, next quarter results and um, is how good was my year? Instead of asking how, what kind of company do I want this to be in 10 years? I mean, of course, we don't know that, but thinking about it and opening up the discussion about it also opens up your mind for these potential black swans, which, and I need to stress that, doesn't have to be horrific. It could also be something beautiful. I want to talk about um, the last phase. We've talked about the first phase, which is information. We've talked about um, the second phase, which I think was, was timing. Let's talk about the last phase, which is hindsight. Um, otherwise, I think, otherwise known as regret sometimes. Um, and you had this beautiful summary of how to handle this phase when you feel like you might have possibly made the wrong choice, the wrong decision. And that was satisfaction versus expectation. Can you explain that equation? Yeah, so the question here is how do we measure um, the outcome of a decision? And this is typically done with two parameters. One is how satisfied are we with our decisions? That's fairly easy to say. On a scale from one to 10, you can say afterwards, I was happy. It's a, that's a 10 or it's a five. And the second parameter is how much did you expect of the decision? And the thing is, the more we expect of a decision, the happier we are if it turns out to be a good decision. So it's a rising curve. But again, there's a tipping point. We can actually we can actually expect too much because we all strive for perfection. We want to have the perfect car. We want to have the perfect job. We want to find the perfect partner. And so the more we expect, the harder it is to be satisfied with that decision because you will always ask yourself, could there have been an even better option? And this is true to small life decisions. For example, people who agonize over which Netflix movie should they watch, they when they finally decide for one, they still keep in their mind this ongoing discussion, mm, maybe we should have tried that other one. <laughs> and so this is the source of unhappiness if we expect too much of any given situation. And uh, psychology researchers have studied this a lot, um, how people make decisions. And they concluded there are two basic styles. One is what they call maximizers. And maximizers like to take their time and weigh a wide range of options, sometimes every possible one, before choosing. 
Um, so those are the ones who look for the whole night, scroll through the Netflix library without choosing. And the other group is called satisficers. So that the word satisfies, that blends satisfy and suffice. And satisficers would rather be fast than thorough. They prefer to quickly choose the option that fills the minimum criteria. And the bottom line here is that maximizers are people who actually make better decisions because their analysis is more thorough um, and they want the very best. And satisficers are people who are more happy with even their poor decisions because they settle for good enough. I love the, I love the term enough. And, you know, the, the decision that I made was enough. I had, I made sure I had enough information and I made the best possible decision that I could with the information that I have. And that was enough to get me to the next place where the next decision had to be made. I just love that, that phrase enough. That was enough. I did enough there because I think that's the hardest thing when it comes to decisions that I didn't make a good enough decision. I didn't have enough information. Um, the situation wasn't perfect enough. And sort of flip that word and actually own the enough. Exactly. And I think also um, there's also a gender issue here that um, female turn to um, try to be more perfect. And this is because they have been raised to, um, if you want to deal with the, the male strong business word, you have to be perfect in order to perform. But also your house has to be perfect. Your children have to be perfect. And one solution, and this is super difficult, of course, to, to, to do, but we have to learn to ask ourselves, what are our minimum criteria? Can I live with good enough? That doesn't mean that you don't have any ambitions. It just means that you won't beat yourself up if you don't match or meet the perfect criteria. And this is something that in decision making has been researched a lot. And people who always strive for perfection, they tend to be less happy with the outcome even if it was almost perfect. I interviewed a, um, a Navy SEAL on this podcast, um, Brandon Webb, and one of the things that he said that I loved and have used many times since is the most important thing when it comes to decision-making is get off the X. And he used that in relation to if you are in, a, you know, as he had been in, in wartime situations and you find yourself dropped in the middle of nowhere and you don't know where you are and you don't know what's happening, most important thing, just move. Just get off the X, take yourself into the situation where another decision will be necessary because you can always correct the last decision that you made, but you can't correct a decision that you didn't make. And so get off the X. Yeah, that's, that, that's interesting. That, that relates to what we talked earlier about that um, some of the worst things that happen, happened have happened because no one took a decision. So being paralyzed is always a risk. It's better to move on, make a decision, maybe correct it. And um, yeah, get off the X. I like that a lot. And it also fits with what you were saying about enough. It is enough just to get yourself moving. That decision is enough to get me to move. And that's all I expected of it. I didn't expect it to be perfect, but it got me moving. And for that to be enough. You've translated this whole conversation that we've had. You know, you, you translated these three phases of decision-making down to three what I thought were just beautifully elegant questions. Can you run through those three questions? Yeah, so if we have these three phases, um, the preparing phase, um, the research strategy, I think the question is, do I know enough? So we have to teach ourselves in order to make a decision, in order to build up confidence, but we don't have to do, overdo this because otherwise we will, we will be stuck, we'll be paralyzed by our own analysis. The second phase is the actual timing, the moment of decision-making. So there's the question, is this the right moment for a decision? And timing is crucial. If you, you can make the right choice at the wrong time, and then it will not be a good decision. And the last <laughs> question is, as we call it, is um, how do I feel about it in hindsight? And we phrase it like, what if Nessie, the Scottish monster of Loch Ness, actually exists? So for anybody who doesn't know who, who Nessie is, Nessie is a, a mythical monster that lives in the lochs, which are the lakes in Scotland. There are many stories told about Nessie but no one has ever seen Nessie. And so the, mythic, the mythical creature. Yeah, and that relates a lot to decision-making because as we talked before, um, if we strive for perfection, we are looking for something that actually doesn't exist. So um, I always think that a perfect decision, that's a little bit like Nessie, the monster in Loch Ness. Um, it's rumored to exist, 
and people have spent their entire life looking for it, but no one has ever seen it. So if we are struggling with a decision, then sometimes we have to ask ourselves, was I looking for Nessie? Was I trying to find a perfect spot that actually doesn't exist? And that's the, the moment of the hindsight. If we, if we look back at a decision, we will realize there are no perfect decisions. You can be lucky. You can, could have been in the, just at the right spot at the right time and done the right thing. Maybe that was also a lucky decision. We should not overthink this moment of, yes, I did the right analysis and then I made the right choice. Because again, going back to these unknown, unknown moments, we can't plan out reality. We also just have to live in reality. And while we're talking about mythical, one of the things that we talk about in my team is the, the mythical 5%, which is that moment where you've, you've got the decision to 95%. It's 95% good. It's 95% solid. But it would be perfect if we just figured out or tweaked this final 5%, this final 5% that nobody will ever notice that will make a negligible amount of difference to the results. But we can't let the decision go. We can't press go on it until we figure out this mythical 5%. And being able to go 95% is good enough. It's good enough. Let it go. Ship it. Get it out. Yeah, and that's where I think as a leader you should step in and say this is good enough because for the people working on the problem, actually it's good that they're striving for these last 5% because they 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 want to achieve the best result and you need this kind of people on your team. But then as a leader, you have to step in and say, guys, let go, this is good enough because they should not see it because they should strive for perfection. It's good to have maximizers on your team. But as a leader, you should rather be a satisfier and say, this is good enough, thank you. You've done your job well. Good enough to get us to the next decision which is the line I'm going to take from this whole conversation. It's good enough to get us to the next decision. Um, I just want to talk about you before, we, before I let you go. You know, has knowing all of this, you said you struggled with the decision-making, has all of this information, have you reached the TMI point is basically what I'm saying. Has it helped you at all with your ability to make decisions? Do you make better decisions now or do you have way too much information about decision-making? I would say that there are a lot of tools, and I think of this as really like a toolbox, like a screwdriver and a hammer, and I think you can use them, and it helps you a lot to work with these tools instead of thinking, I'm a natural good decision maker. You should use these tools, and I I can see on an everyday basis, if I use these tools, I don't make better decisions, but I feel better. I get less stressed. I have more time. I have more energy on my hand. And that, I think, is a, is a gift. So yes, it has changed, but I don't use them often enough. What's the number one tool that you do use that's made the biggest difference? If you had to hone it down to this one tool, if you do nothing else, this one has helped me more than anything else. I would say the most important thing is to take off pressure from the situation. So sometimes I ask myself, When I'm 80 and I look back at the decision, would I regret not having done it? Um, So in in a a way, in 100 years, who's going to care? I think we put too much effort into overplaying the decision we're in. I mean, it's it's just the decision. And it's maybe not going to be as good or as bad either way. And... That said, I think this is not this cannot be applied to everyday life, but I taught myself a lot lately, don't always play it safe. I think we only regret the things we didn't do. So take a step out there, get into the water, because the worst might never happen. And even if it does, I think we have the psychological resilience to cope with it. Get into the water. It takes us beautiful full circle back to the, the initial idea that we discussed about the, the river is the bridge. Was that the, the quote? The river is the bridge? Yeah, sometimes yeah. the river is the bridge. Okay, well, my final question for you today is if I could give you a stage and give you a microphone and in front of you I could somehow magically put every single person that you would ever want to influence and I gave you five minutes, what's the one thing that you would want them to know? I think I would like to talk about hard choices. So these things that we really agonize over, whether to stay in your current job or move to the city or uproot your life for a more challenging work. And when we choose between options that are both good, uh, we can do something that's really rather remarkable and that uh, my cat can't do. 
We can put ourselves behind an option. We can create reasons for ourselves to decide this is the right choice. This is the person I would like to be. So as um, the philosopher Ruth Chang once said, when faced with hard choices, we have the possibility to become the authors of our own lives. So we should embrace difficult situations and hard choices. What I love about what you just said is you're asking, it feels like you're asking people to not make a decision on behalf of the person that you are in this moment, because you might be scared and confused and overwhelmed, but try and step back long enough to make a decision on behalf of the person that you intend to be, the person who you hope to be, the person you work to be. And that should change your mind frame enough to give you some additional insight. Exactly. I, th I think when we face a hard choice, um, we should s actually stop looking for reasons out there. We should be looking for reasons in here. So who am I to be? Uh, we can decide to be a risk taker. We can decide to be a country lover. Uh, what we do in hard choices is very much up to each of us. So we should not treat hard choices as a source of agony or dread or, or horror, but as opportunities for us to celebrate what is special about the human condition, that we have the power to create reasons for ourselves. And so choices are actually not a curse, but it's something beautiful. I'm going to finish on, on that note. Thank you so much for your time, Mikhail. Um, it's been a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Julie. It was great talking to you. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode and have seized hold of at least one tool, idea or mindset that will help you start raising your own level of influence. Now, for those of you who want to take the next step in your journey or would just love a roadmap to becoming the most influential voice, idea or brand in your space, then I have good news. You can now download the latest updated version of my ebook, The Influencer Code, from my website, juliemasters.com. Also, there's a link in the show notes. Just pop in your email address, and I promise I will not spam you, but it is jam-packed full of ideas, tools, and case studies that I have come across in my now 20-plus years of doing this work, not to mention the seven areas and seven core questions that I have found to be hands down the most valuable when it comes to immediately lifting your ability to make an impact. Download it, keep it, share it, juice it for all it is worth. I hope it makes a massive difference in both your career and your business. Thank you always to my co-founder and the main brain behind this podcast, Lauren Kelly. You kick my butt in all the right ways. Thank you for making it happen. And if you did enjoy the show, then we would love you to share this podcast and leave us a review on iTunes, Google, Stitcher, whatever your platform of choice happens to be. And don't forget to subscribe to make sure that you never miss an episode.